morning and welcome to Georgetown Baptist Church Talk entitled Help, I'm Growing Old and Help, My Parents Are Growing Old. My name is Jenny and on behalf of Georgetown Baptist Church, I would like to welcome all of you to this evening's talk. A special shout out to friends who are joining us for the very first time. Thank you for tuning in and we hope that you will find this session beneficial because indeed, this subject is something that we all have to face sooner or later. So it's great to have some heads up information to help us to prepare better. All right, before we proceed further, let me just briefly introduce the team members who have worked very hard to put this program together. First of all, we have Pastor Kok An. He's the senior pastor of GBC and the advisor to our team. And then we have Gary, Chun Fui, and Jimmy, uh, which made up the technical team. And of course, uh, Susan and myself, who will be moderating tonight's sessions. All right, to ensure everybody has a comfortable viewing, yeah? So there are some housekeeping rules that we need to go through. So let us, um, Gary, can you show us the slides, please? Okay, thank you. All right, first of all, you need to click join audio to enable the audio from your device, yeah? So in case you cannot hear us, make sure you click on the join audio button. And for the comfort of all viewers, all participants will be muted throughout the entire session. If you have any questions regarding the subject that we are going to uh, discuss tonight, do drop us your questions at the Zoom Groom chat. And if you wish to remain anonymous because you're asking something uh, pretty sensitive, you can privately message Susan for session one or myself for session two. But do uh, keep in mind that we have a timeline to keep, so we will try our very best to answer your questions, yeah? And um, if the internet connection is unstable, you may stop the video, but continue to listen in. Other things to take note. Do not connect to Zoom with multiple devices in the same room. And do not have two participants connecting to two different uh, devices in the same room. This is to prevent background uh, noises yeah, uh, from coming in. And just another note, the quality of the sound or your video will depend very much on your connection uh, stability. All right, next, uh, I would like to introduce the speaker for tonight, Pastor Chua Tong Ek is the author of the book, Help, I'm Growing Old. He's the former head of Science Department, Malayan Teachers College, Penang, and also the retired associate pastor of GBC, Penang. So just to give you a, uh, an idea about the program outline for tonight, we will have session one, uh, which addresses Help, I'm Growing Old, and Susan will be moderating the Q&A. And after which, I will do a very quick book review of the book, and then we will proceed with session two, uh, Help My Parents Are Growing Old, and I will be moderating the Q&A for this session. All right, so looks like uh, we are good to go, yeah? And uh, so I think before we start this program, I'd like to call upon Pastor Ko An to open us with a word of prayer. Over to you, Pastor Ko An. Yes, thank you, Jenny. Uh, before I pray, I just want to welcome all of you uh, to come to this talk, especially our friends. I see that many of you are, are new to me, so a very good evening to all of you. Can we all give our friends a wave uh, to welcome them? Yes, so many of you. Really great to have you all here. I also want to thank uh, Pastor Chua for sharing with us a topic that is so relevant to every one of us. You know, we all grow old. There's no exception. Eh? And at every stage of our life, it has its own unique challenges. And we need knowledge and understanding so that we can overcome those challenges well, so that we can embrace life and enjoy life fully. So I'm really looking forward to this talk. And I'm sure we all learned some 
uh, practical tips to help us live a healthy, a joyful and a purposeful life. And I believe all of us want to stay strong and we want to age gracefully. Do you agree? Okay, let us go to God and to ask for his leading and for his presence for this evening. May let's bow our head and pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we're grateful that you love and care for each one of us and that you're concerned about our well-being at every stage of our life journey. Lord, we pray that you enable Pastor Chua to share with us, to help us know ourselves better and to give us practical tips to cope with the changes and challenges that we face in our senior years. Lord, help us all to do well physically, emotionally and spiritually. Lord, we commit this time to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Koan. And without much further ado, let's put our hands together to welcome the speaker of the night, Pastor Chua Tong A. Hello. Okay, I'm uh, glad to be with you all. Can I have the first slide, please, Gary? Okay, I think that uh, those of you who are here tonight, you either belong to the young ones or you'll be in the second group to be called once you were the young ones, right? So either way, you'll be one of the groups. You know, there was a lady who one day uh, came up to my wife and she was so, so excited. And she said, you know what happened? I just went to the clinic and the doctor looked up the file about me and look at me and said, 55? You don't look 55. Wow, she said. When the doc, when she heard that comment, it made her day. And that's why she was so thrilled and happy. You know, I have a, I have a sneaky suspicion all doctors are trained to say that. Because then half the battle is won. They're already but a hill. So the question is, just a simple comment can make such a big difference on the mood of a person. And you know, that, that shows how much aging influences us, whether we realize it or not. And uh, it just shows again how much society and the media affects us as well. And so we just have to come to that reality that, in fact, aging is natural. We don't have to keep trying to push back and go backwards, but rather we know that we are going forward and going forward well. You now, my wife's favorite remark always to me is every season of life has its own beauty. Right? So, can we, are we able to see some beauty? in uh, this part of our life, this section. So tomorrow morning when, I, when you look in the mirror and you see some wrinkles in your face, I want you to say, oh, this wrinkle is a line of wisdom, right? And if you see the white hair or more or the whole head of white hair, you should say, oh, this is my crown of glory. And if you have no hair, you can still say, oh, this is my saver. And, uh, you know, without saving, it saves me from all the shampoo I have to spend and also from all the haircuts. Mm -hmm. So it's, though every cloud has got a silver lining. Look on, on it at a different level of what the society wants us to look at. Now I want you to, to just view this short video now. It is about, uh, it is taken from um, a documentary film, a British documentary film called Ping Pong, right? Let's view it together. I don't care how good she is, I should get her. She can't. 
You know, I like this uh, video mainly because of this 100 year old lady. Right? It's called Dorothy. In fact, there's this show you can watch for half an hour about this girl, a bit better stuff of uh, centenarians. And uh, it shows the two aspects. Uh, one is the interviewer. She represents the society's view. She sets limitations on us that you have reached a certain number, whatever the number is, and therefore you cannot do it anymore. You cannot do certain things. But this lady is at the mindset where she says, I'm not that old. It's a good mindset to have as we grow older, that then we can uh, view ourselves differently. We cannot say, oh, you know, I'm a baby boomer. And therefore, I cannot be a baby zoomer. Isn't it strange? We can be baby boomers turning into baby zoomers. So we are always adjusting ourselves and able to learn new things. And I like uh, you know, all of us who are viewing this, especially when you're older, to think like this, that there are many things that we can still learn. It's a lifelong learning process. All right. Then you find that uh, this next slide, um, it's about, uh, and you have a, have a space, Gary. You see, that because of these numbers that sort of uh, often involves us, some people are always thinking of numbers when they think of age, old age, uh, number, number. This person by the name of Peter Lester, he came out with this theory of the third age, where aging has nothing to do with numbers. Rather, it has to do with how, when you enter, how you enter. So, for example, in the second age, it's just that's the time when all of you are working and maybe raising a family. And then when you retire fully, you enter into the third age. And this third age is the one where there are three qualities, the three criteria to be inside this third age. Our next slide will show you this three criteria. And it is, number one, you have got to be healthy, and you're going to be active and productive. As long as you are healthy, that means physically healthy, mentally healthy, emotionally healthy, or you are active, that means you can still move around, you're still independent, and you're productive. You're still able to contribute, whether to your family or to your community, or even to do some simple part-time job, then you belong to this third age. And this third age has been called the golden years of adult. It is a time when really senior people sort of really experience, they say, the happiest times of their lives. Right? You're going to be in this group, people you sort of agree with it. Right? Happiest times of their lives. This, in this third age, you're still healthy, you're still active, and you're still productive. That's the next slide. And so you find then that uh, when you are in this state, huh, then successful aging. Right? Remember, is to spread out this lifespan called the third age to as long as possible. And uh, during this third age, you can, you can sort of pick up your lifelong learning again. And you think to yourself, what are the things that I missed out that I wanted to learn all the time in, our, in my younger years when I was working, I didn't have the time. Well, this thing about it, and you can go to this university of the third age. There's a chain of universities all over the world, and there's even one in Sedang, in Selangor, where you can sign up for courses that you've always wanted to learn. So maybe, Jimmy, you're always interested to do some cooking and learn cooking. Uh, you want to learn how to make some kueh, and uh, 
others want to learn do some acrylic paintings, whatever. You pick up a course and you go and learn. The, the fees are very affordable. And um, more than that, there are no assignments, no exams. That's a nice start of course to take that. Right? But of course, at the end of the day, you also won't get a diploma, right? Because you never see a valid exam. And um, so for this third age then, as I said earlier, it is trying to extend, to extend this third age as far as you can before you enter the fourth age. And so we ask the first question is, when, when do we exit this third age? When do we exit? Some people, because we age differently, you may be two persons 70 years old, but uh, we are different. You may, someone will be mentally uh, sort of more lucid or sharper than the other. It applies for your, also for the physical age. So the, as long as this, uh, you're in this third age, people want to push it as far as possible. So you may be even 100 years old and still be in the third age. You have nothing to do with your a number. It is all to do with being healthy, being active, being productive. I hope you are following me so far. All right. So the question a lot of you ask then is, are there people in the world right now who have managed to uh, extend their third age until very much older? And the answer is yes. Yes, there are such people. And there are clusters in, in, uh, in the world. So you look at the next slide, you see that in fact, they have uh, this, this person called Dan Goodner and his team. He went around the world as an explorer and he came up with five, what he call blue zones. These are the regions in the world where there is an unusually large number of people living healthy and active lives past the age of 100. Now, isn't that interesting? There's not one or two uh, folks around you know, in Penang, maybe you can see it's one or two. But this is a cluster, not a cluster of viruses or something, but a cluster of healthy, active people right, living in these blue zones. Okay, the next, the next slide will show you. Um, where they are. See, there are five uh, regions in the world. Uh, Penang is not inside here, unfortunately. Uh, maybe after hearing this, more and more people will take up and you know, try to, uh, to, to sort of improve their health and so on. So the uh, closest to us is Okinawa in Japan. And then there are two places in Europe, and one in Central America, and one is in uh, California in the US. So these are the five regions. Now, what can we learn? You were know, sort of at that time, in the uh, about 200, about 2006, a lot of people were very interested in about this blue zone. They said, what is it which is common among all these people? What can we learn from them if they have in common? So the next slide will show that uh, these are the uh, common characteristics. Huh? So listen to this, uh, this video and you can learn a lot from them. Okay? Let's have it then. Only about 10% of how long the average person lives is dictated by our genes. The other 90% is dictated by our lifestyle. We're leaving about 12 good years on the table. None of them exercise, at least the way we think of exercise. Instead, they set up their lives so that they're constantly nudged into physical activity. Uh, the Sardinians live in vertical houses, up and down the stairs. They don't have any conveniences. There's not a button to push to do yard work or housework. If they want to mix up a cake, they're doing it by hand. Here we have this area where men live the longest. For people not only reach age 100, they do so with extraordinary vigor. Places where 102-year-olds still ride their bike to work, chop wood, and can beat a guy 60 years younger than them. They have vocabulary for sense of purpose. 
Instead, there's one word that views your entire life, and that word is ikigai. And roughly translated, it means the reason for which you wake up in the morning. For this 100-year-old fisherman, it was continuing to catch fish for his family three times a week. For this 102-year-old woman, her ikigai uh, was simply her great, great, great granddaughter. And I asked her what it felt like uh, to hold a great, great, great granddaughter. And she put her head back and she said, it feels like leaping into heaven. Each of these cultures take time to downshift. The Sardinians pray, the Seventh-day Adventists pray, the Okinawans have this ancestor veneration. When you're in a hurry or stressed out, that triggers something called the inflammatory response, which is associated with everything from Alzheimer's disease to cardiovascular disease. The greatest sort of diet suggestion ever invented is known as the Hara Hachi Bu diet. It's simply a little saying these people say before their meal to remind them to stop eating when their stomach is 80% full. They have all kinds of little strategies to keep from overeating. They eat off of smaller plates. They tend to eat fewer calories at every city. A plant-based diet full of vegetables with lots of color in them and they eat about eight times as much tofu as Americans do. Doesn't mean they don't eat meat, but lots of beans and nuts. Then the foundation of all this is how they connect. They put their families first, take care of their children and their aging parents. And then hardwired right in the religion are nature walks. They also belong to the right tribe. They were either born into or they proactively surrounded themselves with the right people. Uh, they all tend to belong to a faith-based community. The Seventh-day Adventists celebrate their uh, Sabbath from sunset on Friday till sunset on Saturday, uh, tw a 24-hour sanctuary in time, they call it. And these people drink a little bit every day, not a hard sell to the American population. When it comes to longevity, there is no short-term fix in a pill or anything else. But when you think about, about it, your friends are long-term adventures, and therefore, perhaps the most significant thing you can do to add more years to your life and life to your years. It's very interesting you think, to, to, to know that, in, in fact, there is a, a balanced group of people all over the world which we can emulate. Now the uh, I just want to make <clears throat> to now do uh, just summarize all this we said in the video and uh, categorize them. Find that uh, they actually when you look at them carefully, the, uh, the person who did this video they are talking about your physical health, how to look after the physical health, how to look after your mental and emotional health, and then finally how to look after your spiritual health. All these elements are there. There's a very holistic approach to aging. And in the next slide, I just want to first uh, browse through quickly what has been mentioned in the video. In this slide, the next one, uh, on uh, just the diet. You know, in this, this group of people, the blue, blue zone people, they take a lot of plant-based um, uh, food, with little meat, it's high in veggies, fruits, red wine. And this Hara Hachibu, which you may have heard just now, is talking about, you know, when you eat, don't overeat. Uh, which we tend to do here in Penang. Uh, we eat until you are so bloated up. And in fact, after you're eating, you find you're more tired because uh, all, all the blood just goes to your stomach to digest the food. So keep away from, uh, if you want to be healthy, keep away from all the buffet meals, right? Just keep to this simple diet and you find that you'll be more energized. All right. In the next uh, slide, you'll see that uh, it's more than that. You know, when it comes to diet, <coughs> Uh, my wife, I found last time that uh, 
we actually don't know which diet is the best suited for us. Is it Mediterranean diet or so many types of uh, names given and what's the Penang diet? So we decided to just go and visit our dietitian. Right? After all, they are trained to tell us what's the best to do. And this dietitian, I remember she was so excited to see us. You know why? She hasn't, hasn't had received someone. You know, the people who come and see her, those same by the doctors referred to, to her. So we had to walk in, so we had to walk in and say, uh, all right, we want to, you to customize a diet for both of us. And so, okay, so we did it with her once, once a month, one hour a month only. It costs us 25 ringgit each time. And we did it with her for two years. And she slowly tweaked our diet until sort of customized to us. So, for example, when you find that uh, from our blood test, you find that oh, we don't have calcium, she'll tell us, okay, there's something you're going to do, eat more green leaves and so on. And deep, you know? So, it's sort of a big trick at our diet. And uh, we enjoyed ourselves. I'm not saying all of you, you can see a dietitian, but this is what we did. And uh, one of the things she also told us is to take more water, drink more water, because as we age, you find that we forget to drink water. We forget that we are thirsty. And that's why we, we didn't uh, drink the water. So put a jug near to you, take the water uh, consistently. And one other thing we found is that our taste buds can change. Right? So maybe you are used to uh, you know, sort of a certain type of food, but hey, it's okay. Uh, you, it'll be uh, sort of, as we, as we change your taste buds, now we find that you can take a food which are less salty, less, uh, less, less sugar, less sweet, and we are very happy with it. So these are things that we can do and we even control them. All right, the next, next slide will show us that uh, besides uh, the diet, they also talk about exercise. Uh, we, I want to emphasize that for seniors, we still need to exercise. But all the more so, because uh, our muscles, if we just leave them alone, they just tend to uh, sort of uh, entropy down and get and decline. So focus on the moderate ones, Things that you can do, not too uh, intense, and also consistent in our exercise. Consistent here means think long term. So at a certain age, you just regularly exercise. For example, uh, my wife and I have set up a small uh, little, a mini gym in our house. Uh, we do about five times a day. Uh, we encourage one another to do something simple. And uh, it, it makes a lot of difference when you are doing exercising with somebody. So we encourage one another. You may just have some buddies to walk with and so on. In Penang, I see a lot of people walking and a lot of people hiking. That's a good exercise. But I believe that we need to go a bit more than that. It's shown in our next uh, slide. Eh? The next slide will show you that there are four, as we grow old, we still need the four types of exercises. Firstly, we need to stretch, learn some stretching. The stretch ones, uh, stretching exercises will um, again, uh, Loosen certain type of some of our muscles. Uh, we make it more flexible and find that uh, we can still bend as we grow older. One of the things you'll find that if you don't stretch yourself consistently, you can't bend after a while to, to uh, cut your toenails, uh, right? So you're going to get someone uh, who will be uh, sort of a volunteer to cut your toenails. You couldn't bend down to cut your toenails anymore. Strength exercise. Uh, these are just uh, building up your muscles to be strong. And there's another feature, you find that about a lot of old people, when they sit down, they can't get up. Because their leg muscles have become so weak through lack of exercise. So if you do squat exercises every time, some simple squatting, the squat exercises will actually strengthen your, your muscles, the hamstring, the calf, the quadricep. So these are the, the, the muscles we need to strengthen. And above all, these are balance exercises. If you can do them, I would advise, them to, I advise you to do them too. Uh, they will help you to keep a balance. Uh, you don't fall so easily. Even if you fall, you don't fall so badly. So all these uh, four exercises, the last one, including aerobic, which involves uh, breeze walking, for example, for senior people. You find that if you do them, then your heart pumps faster. That's a good blood circulation for you. And all these are important, and they are, and in case you don't know how to do them, well, you have a friend, right? Give you free tuition, and it's called YouTube. See, so go to YouTube, 
just uh, type in, for example, balanced exercises for seniors. Here you are, all coming out. So many people volunteering to tell you what to do, right? So, okay, we don't move on the next one. You find it, uh, this, uh, this add on health screening. I feel that I'm going to be missed out. Uh, check your family history. For my wife, uh, her family has a two, two persons have uh, died of uh, um, this. What do you call that? Uh, colon, uh, colon cancer, colon cancer, and uh, so she goes every five years to do a uh, colonoscopy. It's because of her family history. Uh, don't do a medical and uh, annual medical checkup if you can. There are packages, huh? uh, many people, they just package it. You got basic package at this price, and a more advanced package the other price. So you, you just pick and choose what you want. Then immunization. I realized that many, uh, many seniors are not aware that actually you can get a vaccine vaccinated against shingles, which is very painful, you know, when you're old and your immune system is down, you can get shingles. So just go and have a jab, 100 over ringgit uh, for one jab, and you can, you're covered uh, about 80%. Your, your risk is much lower. And if you want to do uh, the flu exercise, yes, really, you can do that. So these are, these are those extra tips that you can do for yourself as you grow older. So that to keep yourself uh, fit. Okay, the next one we are to talk about is about uh, the importance of mental and emotional health. This is something which often we uh, bypass. Uh, this is because we, most of us are more uh, sort of sensitive to the, the physical, which you can see. But the mental and emotional health are, are equally important. And uh, so in this uh, blue zone people, uh, we find they have strong family ties, and they have a strong community network. And that is a very important element. I feel that uh, folks, uh, you see, in the, among the Chinese culture, I'll talk about it later uh, in the next second session about this multi generational living, the pros and cons, uh, and uh, community living. This strong family ties enables one thing, and it is that uh, you will be able to have a sense of belonging. Strong sense of belonging is important, uh, that, that uh, you, you are needed and you are valued. And also that you have a strong, a strong sense of significance. As you grow older, as uh, for example, people who have retired and their identity is always with their job. It's always, you know, the identity is significance tied to the job. So if you retire, no job. And you can lose your sense of significance. And sometimes a lot of people, in fact, struggle with this, uh, this, this lack of significance they feel that uh, they, they sort of are not, not so important anymore. So these two other elements. I will move the last one um, on uh, spiritual health, which I mentioned earlier. One thing I really I like, like about this video is that it is, uh, it is balanced. I show the people, they are healthy, active people, but they live a very balanced life, right? They look after, they look after their physical health. They also learn how to nurture their spiritual health. It's not so much uh, one-sided. So it is, in fact, has been shown that if, if you learn how to meditate, to, you know, to calm yourself down, meditate, and, and pray, endorphins are also released in your body. Most of us know that when we exercise, we get a good, good dose of endorphins, which, which boosts up our well-being, all right? We energize and feel good, but the same goes also with meditation and prayer. And finally, it's this purposeful, purposeful living. That each day, when you're a senior person, when you get up, you cannot be saying, oh, I don't know what to do. Whole day I got ahead of me, and nothing. Right? Work, you can work out some structure into your day. Uh, just like the, uh, what I mentioned earlier, the time was, you know, there's this man who was asked, uh, you know, during the weekdays, what do you do? You know, uh, nothing much, nothing much. And then the person asked him, how about weekends? What do you do? Oh, weekends, I rest. Right? So whole week, whole week didn't do much, but weekends still rest. And so it, after a while, you get so bored. There's no purpose. Now, I just want to end this session now, the first session, because time is also moving. Um, with this thought, you know, when I prepared this, uh, this slide, I was, I was trying to do something new, right? reading up new, new stuff. These are things not found in my book. And I realized that as I read through about this, Second age, third age, and fourth age. Uh, 
it is a, it's a bit sad. Sad because, you know, you, you work so hard during the second age. And then we work so hard during the third age to keep ourselves fit and active and so on. But finally, we, we still end up the same way. Right? All of us end up you know, uh, in death. It is, it is inevitable. So the thought came to me was, perhaps there's something more. Something more than just the second age, third age, fourth, fourth age. So I suggest to you to think about the fifth age. This is my own theory, right? but it's not really that. Right? That in fact, this fifth age is suggested so much when we look at our own selves. People you meet with, you'll find most of us, unless you've got mental problems or because of drug problems, we all want to live forever. We want to live on. We feel that uh, there's so much more than we can we like to, uh, to live for. And uh, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't want to sort of uh, cut short our own lives un unless we are not well. So the fifth age is, is a time then that uh, we sort of look beyond our death. Uh, and the Bible says, in fact, that uh, God has planted eternity in the human heart. Every human being wants to live on. And uh, so, and just a question here is a distraction. I already explained fourth age. <laughs> All right? maybe, maybe I didn't explain well. The fourth age is the time when you finish your third age. Huh? Right? That means you are not healthy anymore, you are not active anymore, and you are not productive anymore. It is, the, it is more of the end stage. I will talk about the fourth age in the second session. Now, um, so this fifth age is a time then we realize, wow, it's possible. It's possible for us to think further and move into this fifth age. That uh, we have this eternity planted in our hearts. The other day I was uh, amazed to read about this utility plant in uh, Arizona, US. And uh, you know what they are doing? They accept people who have just passed away because of an incurable disease. And so these people are put into a deep freeze of minus, almost minus 200 degrees Celsius. And you have to pay a substantial amount of money to be deep frozen in the hope that one day when medical science is advanced enough to cure the particular disease that they have died of, they can then be defrosted, right? And then they can be uh, resuscitated. And uh, the, one of the speakers who are running this, uh, this utility plant said, interestingly, he said that there are no guarantees but it's worth the shot. It's worth the shot. So you see, when I just listen to this, I realize how much, uh, how much people will really pay for and do in order to live on, and live on, right? And uh, the, the sad thing is, our body, our physical body, is not created to live forever. Our physical body has got a lifespan, has got an expiry date. And uh, our physical body is just like uh, a tent, a camping tent. It's not made to last for a long time. So when Jesus said that uh, those of you who believe in me will live and never die, he's actually talking about the spirit, our human spirit. He's not talking about the physical body. And what we need to, to pay attention to is the human spirit which lives in us. And to realize that this human spirit is so, so important. I really need to take some action over our human spirit. The other day, you know, my, my brother, a younger brother, came and stayed with me for a few days. And um, so one night we were together talking. And so I, um, I just said, oh, you know, you, we, are, we are running. I mean, uh, we are getting on in age. And you're the only person, you know, in the family. Or not come to Christ, you know, even our parents, in spite of their you know, not being literate, 
that believe in Jesus. I said, what? I'm curious to know. I said, what is it which is blocking you from uh, turning your life to Christ? And so he thought for a while and he told me, it's because of the lives of some Christians that seem to have blocked him. And he said, especially his neighbor, who was said he was a Christian, but gave a lot of problems. And I, I said, hey, yeah. I had the same problem what lost uh, some time ago when uh, I was a student at university. We had a we, we had someone coming to every Saturday coming to eat with us, and he he will always come and eat, and he doesn't contribute anything, and uh, he will just he doesn't help to uh, clean up or to wash up or to dry the plates, but he keeps coming, and I was so annoyed with him. You know, I was not a Christian at that time. I said, "Oh boy, is that, how can he call himself a Christian?" But I've learned somehow to look beyond the followers of Christ. I look beyond the followers and I look to Christ himself. He is the one, his life and his place. And so that makes all the difference. And I bought, uh, I bought, I remember I bought the Bible and I started reading the Gospel of Mark. It's a very understandable book. So I think one night I just uh, realized I need to accept Jesus in my own life. Now, just lastly, I just want to say that all of us are different. I've come to realize that some of us are, are thinkers. We come to God only through our minds. We have so many questions that, that we need to answer. Some of us are feelers. We need to be moved, right, by our emotions. Maybe we hear someone's stories and then only we, we accept Christ. Some of us are seers. I know how true that is my own mind. You, have, you need to see something. You need to see something. Then only we can believe. And so these are the books. We need to see a miracle, see something that you believe. So whatever it is, the main thing is we just go back. We should start somewhere, right? And my challenge to you tonight is just to think about it, to start somewhere. Perhaps you can be like me, get the Bible, start reading the Gospel of Mark. So thank you, huh? thank you for listening to me. And at the end of this slide. Just remind ourselves it's never too late, right? Never too late to just uh, sort of forget all the regrets you've had and to move on with a new perspective in life. And you're never too old, never too old to change, never too old to move and have a new perspective, never too old to explore, right? What Jesus can mean to you in the old age. So thank you for listening. All right, we're going to move on now. I'll Ask Susan, she's got some questions to ask me. Okay, Susan, up to you now. Thank you very much, Pastor Chua, for teaching us so much uh, about our own aging um, in session one. Um, we are now in the Q&A session and uh, we have received some questions. Um, we have about six minutes to cover most of the questions that we can cover. All right, so for the first question, um, he says here, if we have not been prioritizing our health in the past, at roughly what age uh, do you think we should start taking our own aging seriously? Oh, my answer is start now. All right? Start now. <laughs> uh, start as early as you can. In fact, uh, I would say in your 30s, you can just start thinking and then uh, keeping consistently your exercise, your, you know, your diet. See, for us and my time anyway, we, we had very little information. You know? We're not aware of many things. Huh? Now uh, it's easier with the internet, we can get access. So to my advice is that what, what you have done today, pick, up, pick some points, get started. It's easier than that. Huh? If you want to, you can, right? Let's go on to question two then. Yeah, okay. So those who are in your 30s and above, uh, please take note. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so next question. Um, now we all know that uh, to be healthy, we need to move and exercise. Um, however, if we do not have strong legs and we do not want to use walking aids, how do we get motivated to move and exercise? It's a trouble. You have no strong legs all the time. You have never exercised the legs. I've already told you before. <laughs> you got to start early and work those, uh, those muscles, squat. The longer you leave it, the weaker your, your legs will be. In fact, a lot of seniors have problems with legs. You, you look around carefully, 
it's not their heart problems or what, no, they are having leg problems, they walk very slow, they limp. And uh, once you have started to have problems, you have a pain or discomfort, you tend to walk less and less. And so you got to uh, sort of walk on it, which areas are giving you pain, you got to fix it, and then you get start walking on it. Don't wait, all right? Just start. All right. Same, back to the same thing, it was a one, two. All right, motivate yourself if you can. Get, some, get a few people and motivate each other. So maybe exercise in a group or something? Yeah, yes, exercise. Uh, you can start off small. You see most of the exercises you see on YouTube, uh, they are graded. You can, you can, you can sort of uh, say, uh, say for example, you put uh, walking, sort of walking is a brisk walking. Eh? Mm -hmm. So strength exercises. Instead of for seniors, you can put for senior beginners. So just even simpler, even simpler exercises. And you work out slowly, like work up slowly from there. Start, start small, start simple. Do something doable. All right? Okay. Then okay. okay, the next question is, in terms of building relationships and being healthy, do you know of any games or activities that seniors can safely engage in with younger people? Oh, of course. You know, you know the ping pong we saw on the show just now? Yeah. <laughs> Studies have shown uh, that Ping pong and dancing uh, keeps away dementia. Oh, and that's a big revelation, isn't it? So in fact, after we realized this, our seniors group bought a ping pong table. Right? Oh. That's how it all started. Right? It keeps away dementia. And uh, we, in fact, there are four good players. We could even uh, now put a challenge to, to the young adults. Uh, we can have a game together, a simple okay, game. I, join you. Pong, huh? yeah? I love to play ping pong too. <laughs> oh, yes, play ping pong. And uh, it's interesting also that last time we also had some meeting together with the kindergarten children. Mm -hmm. uh, once in two years, the seniors have a, some session with them. We play our ukulele and sing to them. And then they will sing back to us. So these are uh, with our younger people. We have, we have interacted with them before. Uh, and uh, occasionally, I mean, I remember the church had a, a walkathon, five kilometers. Some of us entered also. We were able to manage the five kilometers of walking. So, wherever the opportunity, I think seniors should, should get involved, right? Then opportunity crisis. Again, I have one more question. Okay, the next question pertains more to kind of emotional health. It says here, how do elderly couples live lovingly together till the end when there's no common interests in life? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> they all know. They walk hand in hand to the sunset, right? <laughs> the, the problem is, you do know something that no. statistics show that, um, that the divorce rates uh, are highest is in the beginning of a marriage and at the end, the end part of the marriage when the, uh, oh. when the children have left, they've grown up. Oh. See what has happened in a lot of marriages is this, that uh, the couples sort of carelessly, they're so focused on their careers and the children that uh, they, they lost touch with one another along the way. And so when they have this stage called the emptiness syndrome, suddenly they, they know that they realize they've changed so much. Each of them have changed so much. They have nothing in common again. A simple solution, you, you read that question, will be, oh, I think we've got to find, maybe you can find some uh, new, new common interest in life. That's worth exploring. But, uh, from my understanding is that very often marriages are not so simple, right? When you dig a bit deeper, it's not just no common interest, right? It's more than that. And along the way, they have actually hurt each other. They have hurt each other in the midst of these uh, years. Uh, if you're interested, you can read up. Huh? There's this uh, John Gottman, he's like a guru for marriage counseling, right? He can predict divorces, right? Just from uh, talking with people. And there are four areas. He calls them the four horsemen of the apocalypse, right? Follow the Bible. But these are the four horsemen which affects the uh, marriage badly. And uh, one of them, for example, is criticism. Oh. Uh, along, along their marriage journey, after a while, they, they, don't, they don't know how to complain about something. They, every time they say something, it is to criticize. Now, the difference between criticize and complain is this, right? For example, if the husband forgets to switch off the light, 
Okay, the wife can complain and say, "No, you forgot to switch the light again." That, that's a complaint. Mm. A criticism is, is like this, right? The husband forgets to switch on the light, and she says, "You useless idiot! I already told you so many times huh, that uh, you cannot be doing this. Our electricity is so high." And so he uses, she uses rather, uh, in the criticism, she attack the person and not the behavior. You attack the person, that you're useless, so that you tear you down. Now, this type of uh, activities, uh, we call activities, uh, will break down marriage very fast. Right? So perhaps along the way, they have, they have handled this. They could have much more to do, you know. They have, there's a forgiving, there's a lot of uh, work to be done. To really just uh, not so simple as just finding a common interest, right? Yeah. So you can see a marriage counselor has a lot of work to be done. Now your next question. One last one, maybe now is uh, uh. I think the time is up. One last question. <laughs> time is up already for session I, one. Okay. Yeah. So thanks for all your questions. Uh, yeah. Apologies if we have not covered all that have come in. Uh, however, you may find some of your answers and more in Pastor Chua's book. So over to you, Jenny. Thank you, Susan. And thank you, Pastor Chua, for an exciting session one. You know, we have learned so much. You talk about the fourth age, the fifth age. Yeah, I think these are new insights which, you know, will really help us yeah, to, to move on from where we are. All right. So it is with uh, great pleasure that uh, I would like to do a short book review of uh, Pastor Chua's book, Help, I'm Growing Old. So as you can see on the slide, the one on the left was uh, first written in 2009, and then after which, the one on the right was released in uh, 2014, which is an updated version of the older one. So Pastor Chua actually included uh, topics like, you know, technology and all that. So, uh, the subjects or the topics yeah, that is uh, contained in the book ranges from eating healthily, staying fit, physically and mentally, right up to how to prepare for retirement. So I guess, you know, it's, it's, uh, these are topics which are very relevant and I can assure you that it is a very easy to read book, easy to relate with, and with illustrations, yeah, which are very humorously drawn. I, I actually enjoyed looking at the illustration, really, and have a good laugh, you know. And it's perfect as a gift as well. All right, now, so how to get it? You can WhatsApp Richard uh, from Tuesday to Saturday, 9 to 5, uh, at this number. Yeah, you can see on the slide, yeah, the, the number is there. And it's available from 11 July till the 31st, all right? And it is uh, available at a very attractive price of 35 ringgit per book. Yep, so get a copy and enjoy reading it, yeah? Okay, all right. So, Master Chua, are you ready for session two? Yes, I am. I hope you're okay. ready. Okay, all right. Over. Back to you again, Master Chua. All right. Now, after, I've, uh, after I, I wrote the book, some uh, young adults actually came and see me and said, you know, why don't you help us uh, write another book uh, right, to help us uh, be a proposed of our old parents. Uh, they said. Sometimes uh, as they grow older, they seem to be a bit more weird. You know, their behavior, we also don't know what to do, how to handle them, to manage them. Well, I have not written this book yet. I'm going to put a title. Uh, right? The title is My Parents Are Growing Old. Oh, okay. We'll look forward to it. <laughs> so, what I realized is, you know, we, uh, a lot of the young people, some of them are actually, these young kids are very good kids uh, because they are concerned. I believe it's fantastic if your kids are good enough just to be concerned about the, uh, the age parents. And uh, because it raises their awareness that they want to educate themselves so they won't be shocked. Because some people are shocked from the, from the, uh, the uh, young people. They said, my parents are in uh, earlier years. I can think of them. They're so fit. Right? They're climbing up in the balloon all the time. And now they are shadow of themselves. They were so shocked and they cannot accept it. They cannot accept the, uh, the aging of their own parents. So you educate yourselves. And then I have next uh, the slide here. How do you educate? Huh? And uh, you find that next time I give some pointers. 
uh, Gary, just walk the next slide. It is uh, to try to understand that your, your parents are changing, right? They're changing, not just physically, but more than that. Now, let me tell you a story. There was just a young couple who lives in Penang, and uh, yeah, the uh, in-laws stay in Johor Bahru. It's a long way. And so they visit the in-laws only once a year. Right? They will fly down to Johor Bahru. So they went down, and once they said, hey, hey, how in-laws, I mean, uh, this, this uh, girl was thinking, how come the house is so run down and they don't do anything? And so they said, no, Mama, can you just, uh, why don't you fix up your old house? Uh, we can help you with the bill, you know, the pay. And, and so they left it as that. The next year, they went down again. They thought the house would be done up. But to their horror, it's still the same. In fact, it's even worse. The roof was leaking. And uh, many things are not working. But uh, the, uh, the elderly couple didn't do anything again. They seemed to be quite fit physically, but they didn't do anything. And so it took them some time to realize that hey, actually their parents actually age in the area of mental, mental age, right? So as, uh, as a person uh, sort of uh, ages mentally, you become more and more indecisive. They, they feel very indecisive, they feel very helpless. And they're even ashamed to admit it. And so they don't even admit to their children. They're ashamed also of taking their money to renovate the house. So it takes some, uh, some discovery, you know, you got to dig a little bit further and find that uh, your parents age, uh, uh, not just physically, mentally and emotionally, and the second two are much harder to detect. All right, I, and in looking after them, I'm going to, I forgot to mention, but just empathize. Huh? When you are dealing with old people, empathize means, I see, it's, it's, it's something not so easy for the young adults to do because they, they don't know how the old person, what the old person is going through. They have never been there, isn't it? Right? But interestingly enough, the old person also have not been there. I mean, they have not been, they have not been that old, and the young people also have never been that old. So both sides are actually on the learning curve. Right? Huh? So I like this, uh, this, this, this theory of uh, second age and third age. Uh, I want you to take note uh, that the second age is the, the working. They are the, uh, the young person, young adults are still working, right? And if their parents can be on the third age, it will be wonderful. Uh, because third age is a time when they are still active, healthy, productive. Okay? So easy, right? They are working. The parents are still healthy, active, productive. But you imagine their parents are not in a third age. They have already gone on. They didn't look after themselves. They have moved on already to the fourth age. They are going to the fourth age. And so now you find that the, the young people, they are in the second age, working with young children. The parents are in the fourth age. Very, very dependent on them. And so these young adults, we say that they are sandwich generation, right? They are sandwiched between two groups, uh, their children and the aged parents. And the pressure is very great on them, right? You, you could handle two groups at the same time. So anyway, coming to this mental emotional needs, I want to just uh, focus on the three, three common ones uh, that uh, although they are growing old, they still have the, a great need to connect. Don't think that they are very quiet and it's okay. Just let them. They actually need to connect to the outside world to connect to you, right? And so, one of the easiest way if you want to communicate with them is to communicate in the right way, right? If you want to go up to them and say, "Oh, you know, I look, look at this new new smartphone I just bought, I don't know, Galaxy or Samsung, whatever this," don't think they connect. They cannot connect with you. The best way to connect is to remember this principle. They, if they are 70 years old, for example, they have lived 70 years, they have a long, a long past history. Right? So you, you want to focus on that long past history. 
talk to them about their past. You talk to them about the past. Their long-term memory is still very good. And they can tell you a lot of stories. You make them alive. Right? So this is something you can work on. Uh, the other way is to bring them out. Bring them out, out with you. Whenever you can, bring them out. It, it helps to keep them connected to the outside world. Now, I mean, my son lives next door to us. We, we have a good practice, a good tradition. Every Saturday night, everybody goes out together. Uh, including uh, my daughter-in-law's mother, who was a bit older, older, but more into the fourth stage, fourth age rather. And so, but we, we take her out, and she goes out also to the church. It's good for them, right? Just so these are two ways I can think of immediately to help them connect. They still need to remain significant, as I had said earlier, right? So you can think of ways, think of ways to how to. Um, help them to remain significant. You see, all the uh, most of the old people, they have some skills in the past. There are some things they love to do. So think about those things. If you can let them do those things huh, when they're older, they will keep feeling significant because then they will realize they can contribute something. You know, my mother used to stay with us for a while, and one of the things she loved to do is patchwork, right? Get all those uh, leftover cloth of different colors and put them together and she'll cut it up and sew and take a long time slowly over there and come up with a beautiful blanket, you know, a patchwork out blanket. Sometimes she'll do, uh, you know, a little uh, comfort out thing for you to wipe your feet. And again, all this patchwork. So it, it keeps her uh, busy and it keeps her feeling significant. And at the end of the day, she has something, she produced something beautiful. Now, at that time, when she was doing this, huh, I was uh, still a younger man, all right? I was, I was not, uh, I was still very clueless about this, this importance of significance, you know? I never realized importance. So fortunately, my wife could see the, the, the importance and she went out and buy all those, you know, search and buy all those leftover cloth and so on. And, uh, she, she made the effort. I was rescued, right? Rescued by my wife. So only now I realize, wow, but hindsight, what an important, what an important thing for them to do. So you, when you look at your parents, uh, just think, think of it. What were their interests when they were young? They would, they would love to do that, and they keep them feel significant, and they're very happy. And last one is the need for familiarity. This this point is very important when you want to consider uh, putting a person into a in, uh, each person into a nursing home. Because the nursing home actually is a very sudden change, very sudden change of the environment. They really love familiar territory. You know, when, when the building, the impact building was ready, yeah, I was actually asked, does your senior school want to go over uh, to a bigger room? You know, the, and ask the seniors, a few of them don't want to change, they don't want to go. Not everybody, but a few. I mean, if I'm gone, some of them will not follow. Right? So, okay, lah, for the sake of those who long for the familiarity of the old room, right? they say the toilet, they know where to go, and so on and so forth. So, okay, we are, we are still doing it. Until such a time, maybe so some of these uh, people are no longer around, and they'll, they'll make a change. The familiarity is so important. You know, I, I have your classmates, uh, they, they, are, they, are, they are sort of living overseas now, and uh, they, they sort of uh, come back every year, and they still got to go back to Taiping every year to eat their chi chong fan. So oh, these people are really uh, uh, sort of longing for familiar things of the past. So these are a few factors to keep in mind uh, so that their they needs, uh, both mental and emotional, is matched. Right, so on the next, next slide. Now, I'm going to talk now of uh, just how you're taking care. I just want the one, one person to respond because uh, we are running short of time. Uh, I just asked Jenny, all right? Just get a sort of a little bit of feedback. Uh, how, do you, how are you taking care of your age parents? Uh, just, to, just for the okay. sake of it. Yeah. Uh, all right. Yeah. Um, it's my mom. Uh, she stays alone uh, by choice because she wants her own space and she enjoys doing things uh, her way. Lah. Uh, the exception is uh, when she needs care, like 
post-surgery uh, times or even the recent MCO, at times like this, then she will come and stay with me because we, we reckon that it is safer for her to do that. Um, my brother and I assist by buying food and really provisions for her. Lah. And also we make it a point to uh, accompany her, bring her and accompany her for her hospital appointments. Yeah. And uh, how do we connect with uh, each other? Well, by telephone. So we will talk every day. So usually she will be the one who, who calls me. Lah. And, um, and she also keeps connected with whatever that's happening around her uh, news and all that lah, by watching uh, news on TV, especially uh, 8 TV. Yeah, that's her favorite uh, TV channel, 8 TV, yeah, with all the Taiwan movies and all that also. So uh, she tunes in and she knows what's going on. Yeah, so that's how she connects with uh, the outside world. And uh, also she uh, connects with the Lord by worshipping Him, uh, praying to Him, as well as reading His Word every day. And um, socially, she connects with a few close friends. Again, it is through telephone calls. They will call each other for chit-chats and, and all that. So I'm really thankful that she has a group of good friends, you know, who keeps her company by, uh, you know, uh, all the chit-chats, huh? with all the chit-chats. And um, she's still uh, moving around actively, though she, uh, her legs are getting weaker, but she still can move around the house, yeah? And uh, she, she keeps herself mobile and she keeps herself occupied by cleaning her house. And I can say that, you know, her house is sparkling clean, yeah? <laughs> So, uh, yeah, in a nutshell, this is uh, how my mom... Yeah, I would say uh, that she's aging well, right? Aging yeah. well, and uh, she's still in the third age. Yeah. And uh, I think it's, uh, two of you are doing a good job. Uh, <laughs> you just have to continue to plan. Plan ahead. Uh, plan ahead. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that uh, you... And she moves on to the fourth age. We are all, we are all ready with the plan, right? Yeah. Okay, let's move on to the next uh, slide then. I just want to give you... Uh, there are, this one we consider two or three important questions uh, when we have old people. Uh, one of first of course is whether you, are you going to stay together with them or are you going to stay apart? That is a common question. What is good for us? So I would say that the pros here of staying together is uh, well, you might consider, if you're on a tight budget, well, there's savings. Uh, maybe the person who is, uh, maybe your age parents are not that old and they could help around the house. Um, but the last time we were, we were staying in government quarters, we had a big compound. And uh, my father, who was still, um, still very healthy, he was, he was used to mow the grass every few days. You know? So we let him do it, he enjoys himself. Uh, staying together also gives you more bonding time with one another. And also the opportunity for you, for you to role model for your kids. Huh? Because you want to show your respect for the parents. So your kids are watching you, right? And in the same way, they, they will do for you when, when you're older. But there are also cons, of course. The next slide you find, staying together has such problems. Perhaps you need a bigger place, or you need to renovate your current place. There's a question of adjustment to one another. Uh, not everybody can uh, see eye to eye and live in close quarters. They tend to step each other's toes. So sometimes there are possible tensions in relationships. My, my parents stay with, with us, uh, you know, for how many years? 30 over years, would you believe it? 30 over years, they stayed with us. So there were, there were times when we had to adjust quite a lot. There were times of tension, natural, right? And uh, we managed to, uh, to survive, uh, to survive the storm of 30 over years of staying. Uh, my wife was, uh, was a real uh, a gem. Uh, she is very patient and long suffering. You need, really need that. Not every person can handle that. So you also need to consider time. You need to spend enough time with them. You cannot just ignore them as strangers. But this is a question you need to ask yourself when they come to the fourth page and you need to stay together. Okay, next one is about uh, the next question. Uh, it's not a question rather. Possible solutions are to overcome this. I thought that here are some three possibilities. Perhaps you can stay apart for as long as possible. You don't need to come, down, come together so fast. Uh, Right? That, like our case, uh, it's a bit too fast. Uh, when you're in the 50s, you never come over and stay and they all sit together a long time. 
they, they lived until they were 90 and 91. It's a very long time together. Or you can consider staying close by, you can still see each other more often. And, uh, or you live in a double story house, you know, they stay downstairs, you stay upstairs. So currently, uh, in our case, uh, my son Andrew stays next door to us. So we are near and yet not so near. So it gives us space for each other and it works very well. So this is the first question, uh, staying together or staying apart. All right, let's look at the next one. Um, that uh, this is often uh, a question often asked because the time will come when staying together also you cannot manage because uh, your each parents could be uh, could need nursing care already, right? Medical care, and you just can't manage anymore, and you got to start thinking, you know, what what shall we do? So one way of course is to have home care where you have a domestic mate, domestic mate uh, stays with you. It's still affordable. You can still do it. Uh, then, then the, your age parents will feel good because the family is surrounding. They don't have to go anywhere. And they still, still see the family moving around. And the best part is this, they still have choices. Right? They can say, oh, I want to eat this. Or I don't want to bathe yet. That's too early. One of the problems is, uh, with nursing homes is quite regimented. I've visited many, many uh, nursing homes. You know, most of them at 8 o'clock, they will get everybody out and start bathing them. Whether you feel like having a bath or not, is, is uh, you know, you're going to go and they'll take you in and shower you up early, right? And uh, so this is, this is the type. There's a lot of adaptation. The more adjustments are required. But uh, then the time will already come and you have no choice. Uh, you cannot stay together. Uh, and that there is even the main side. We, we had a, I had a problem uh, during my experience. Is, uh, there was a time when the maid stayed with us. Uh, she went on off on, on a holiday, the one month usual holiday. She promised to come back and never came back. Right? I bought an etiquette ticket for her, but she didn't turn up again. And uh, so I was caught, caught uh, unexpected. And to get another maid at the last moment, it is another three months. And because she was so heavy, my mother was a very heavy woman. She never believed in dieting, you see, right? Every time we tried to help her to diet, eh? she, will, she will hide the sugar and she will hide the count you in her room. Until lately, and much later on, I discovered, oh, this is hiding. She doesn't believe in dieting. So she was very, very overweight. And uh, anyway, I, we couldn't handle her. We put her in the nursing home, chop this chop while, until we get new maid. Um, so we realized uh, it, it, not all these problems are nursing home. Right? So the next uh, next time we'll show you if you want to do a nursing home how to choose a good nursing home uh, the pointers here is uh, you know you want to get one which is licensed right preferably licensed one most of them here are licensed i'm not good how i'm not sure how good is the enforcement managed by a board not just a simple you know one or two persons there's some balance there you do an online search first about the place. Probably, the, if there is a, I don't know, they have a website, it's quite glossy and looks very good, but you need a personal visit. And don't visit, you don't, have, don't try to visit in their visiting hours, uh, visit hot hours. You get us, you see the real situation. Uh, cleanliness, yes, very important. I think they are quite all right there. A garden, well, not all of them will have it. Then good ventilation. And then the staff ask some questions. Uh, where are they trained? If, are uh, they mostly just foreign mates? All right. Are uh, they friendly? And finally, the fees. If you want a, uh, a nursing home where it's sort of uh, less people, then you, you must prepare to pay more. Right. So the prices, as I understand it, now ranges over about thousand to even up to four thousand plus. That type of price you must prepare to pay. Uh, so it takes some searching. Uh, we. Uh, Judy from our, our support group, senior support group, she has come up with a list of nursing homes. Uh, it's not a complete list, but it's a good start. Eh? So if you, if, you, if you want to copy or so, you can just put in your, you know, just let the, I think Jenny know, she will send you a copy and by email for you to bring up. The, the prices change a lot, so we, uh, we, we don't have the prices, we just have the name and the phone numbers, right? Uh, next, uh, next slide then is uh, being being a caregiver, right? So the once your age parents are very old, you find that you are you turn you turn into a caregiver whether you like it or not. 
to be thank God that a lot of, of young people here have, uh, you know, they really try to honor their father and their mother. I always uh, find it so fantastic when they do that. But it's, they are prepared to, uh, to sort of uh, put effort into it. So, so you ask yourself, can, can my other siblings help out or not? Uh, but of course, if, if you are the only child, there's not much you can do, right? Then uh, remember that looking after an old person is different from looking after a child. See, a child, uh, child is sort of used to authority, authority figure. You put the rules, they will follow, right? A senior adult, uh, you put the rules, they might not follow, right? So they have their own, uh, they have their own ideas how things be done. You know, they can be very stubborn. They have their own mindsets. So you have to handle the senior adult a bit differently, right? Don't be confrontational with them. If you're confrontational with them, right? Then you force what's going to happen. You either they will, they will, you know, sort of uh, sulk, right? Sulk and don't want to talk to you, withdraw themselves, huh? or they could even cry, and you and make you feel really bad. See? So uh, just just uh, remember this this thing called empathizing, right? That uh, about earlier. Empathize. Empathize means uh, means that you can, you try to put yourself in their shoes, but not exactly, yeah, you can't do it 100%. I'll give you an example of empathy. Yeah. For example, you, you come back from work, and uh, your age parent says, no, your mother says, which mother says, oh no, yeah, my, my leg is painful, right? Now, if you, if you uh, say, hi, yeah, Every old people also pain, pain, uh, left here pain, there uh, pain, pain. I also got pain. Uh, that's not empathizing, right? But if you can just turn around and look at the uh, the person at your the mother's face and say, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give you some oil. You can just put it on first. Uh, tomorrow, you know, when I'm free, I call uh, call Doctor Tan Ban Singh. Give me come and have a look at you. Right? Uh, that's a bit more empathy, right? You, you, you sort of uh, show that you are trying to link up, link up with the person and you recognize, you recognize the need. That's, that's what they want sometimes, to recognize that they did something, right? And of course, there are bad behaviors. You do read about these bad behaviors, you know. Uh, some uh, age parents give, give a lots and lots of problems. You know, once I was speaking in Singapore, to a group of caregivers, and also about aging, aging things. And at the end of the meeting, one uh, young lady came up, she was crying. Because she, in her case, she said, her mother is a widow. And she was the only child. See? And uh, she couldn't, they couldn't afford to get a maid to, uh, to look after the mother. And neither could they afford to go to a nursing home. What, is, what did she do? Oh, she did a fantastic thing, you know. She left her job to look after her mother. But the trouble is, it is that's what happens. Like when you sort of look after a person for a long time, you can take each other for granted. But sometimes, you know, she, she herself is so tired. And uh, she may have raised her voice. And the mother just, you know, uh, felt so offended and so on. And she, she herself feels so bad. So that's why she came out and asked me to pray for her. So I can understand how difficult it is to be a caregiver. To be a caregiver, you need to have a time for breaks. You've got to work out somewhere. Every week you need a break, right? Perhaps every few days you need a break. So work out. You can have breaks, for example, you get a nurse in for a few hours. See? Someone you pay for the hour, you give you a break. Uh, if you're a close friend or whatever. So you can think of, think of how to do that. Nowadays in Penang, you can you do get uh, able to get hourly hourly mates or hourly nurses. They are available, uh, and that that will be a good help for you. So imagine the bad behavior. If you find that some of your uh, if you end up with a case where bad bad behavior, example, they are very unmissable, They can become abusive and scold you and so on. You first have got to try to find out why, why the reason why there's a change in the behavior, very drastic change. Why are they like that? The strength wasn't the point. Ask yourself why are they like that? Do some uh, detective work 
And then on top of that, uh, you got to think, think of ways that you got to be very creative to find out uh, what can you do about this behavior. And you got to go a bit deeper. Like, huh? You don't have time for that. So the last slide that I want to show you is uh, to just say that, you know, looking up your age parents, communication uh, is the key. Communicate with them early. Don't wait until they're so old already that you don't talk to them, right? Talk to them when they're much earlier. Keep the, the channel open. Talk about things which are important. Right? Now, would they like to go to a nursing home or not? How do they feel? How about the wheel? What do you want to do, you know? Uh, do they, uh, when they pass away, what type of burial? You can talk about these type of things early. And uh, when you do that, I believe that if you do, do what you, you need to do, you can live on after that with no regrets. I know of this, uh, with this uh, heard, heard of this person. Um, their family is a very sort of a loving family. And of course, with this, right? Very loving family. But the man, you see, he was so involved with his corporate, this sort of people are up the corporate ladder with very heavy responsibilities. And the next thing you know is, oh, the mother has died. And they didn't have much time to spend with the mother. And he, you know, he sort of, he lost something and he regretted it. So a few, a few years later, he quickly resigned from his job and left to live with the father. So it just showed that, uh, you know, we, we just learned to have this perspective in our lives, uh, perspective, uh, uh, to value your loved ones so that you can live on with no regrets, right? Okay, so with this, I, I, I finished already, but I have no time for question, the Q&A, and how many questions and everything. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Looks uh, like we are running, you know, uh, quite late already, but uh, maybe, maybe, can we... Maybe just try one question. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah, sorry. yeah. Which, which was actually sent, yeah, sent earlier. Uh, pertaining to, you know, uh, placing parents at the uh, old uh, nursing homes, yeah? The question is, is it okay or ethical to place my aging father in an old folks or nursing home? I can't give him the attention and care because of my work and other commitments. How should I prepare him for such a move? How can I cope with a sense of guilt and the questioning or criticism from relatives? I think these questions are very, very real, you know, at the back of yeah. everybody's mind. What will people say? What will people think? So how do we sort out, you know? Okay, very relevant question. Right. First, first thing, let's put it all right. Eh? Don't bother what people are saying, all right? <laughs> Don't bother about the armchair critics. The armchair critics, I must recognize that. Mm. If, they can, if they can volunteer to help out, then you listen to their comments. If they cannot volunteer, they're not interested in volunteer, sorry, that's where you cut off. So that's how you do it. Okay, that's not finished. Right, the second thing is, you have only two choices. You, can't, you cannot cope really. Either, either you, you send them to a nursing home or you will not be able to look after your father. Your father is not after the father well. You cannot do it. If you don't look, you don't look after your father well, the armchair critics will criticize you also. Right? You don't look after your father well, they will buy food properly and so on. The same thing. So you will have to, uh, to handle that too. So you got, it's a decision. It's just a realistic decision. It's nothing to do with ethics. You have to do something realistically. Mm. Right? And uh, whatever guilt feelings you have, it's, it could be just a false guilt. As long as you have done your very best for your parents, for your father, you just go ahead and do it. So God bless you. I uh, say God bless you, right? You are a good son. You're honoring, honoring your father and your mother. You know that in, in, in some countries in the world now, they have got to put in a law, right? A law. If you don't, main, don't maintain your parents, don't look after your parents, you can be punished. Mm. See? Yep. So uh, this, this, is, this is something that you can take out. Right? Okay. Uh, All right. Thank you so much, Pastor Chua. I think this... Pastor uh, wants to have a few more questions, sir. Uh. <laughs> you know? Yeah, but uh, it's already in, uh, 9.56. <laughs> yeah, Jenny, why not we give uh, maybe two more, two more questions? Oh, okay. okay. All right. Okay, so this one, um, yeah, this, this one is talking about uh, are there practical ways that can help to reduce the risk of our parents from getting hurt? Lah? 
uh, you know, sometimes uh, because being old, sometimes their legs are weak and all that. So um, how can we, you know, uh, reduce the risk of, of them getting, yeah. Uh, yes, I understand that. Yeah. Actually, there are a few ways uh, with the blood recommend. First of all, uh, the most dangerous thing I feel is a gas stove, right? Mm. And uh, I would suggest changing gas to induction. Okay. In, in UK, yeah, they're all induction. There are no households using gas anymore. So, and that's not very expensive. There are many ways, there are many types of induction. I'm just trying to do some testing. The induction stove nowadays also heats up very fast. So there's no problem. It, it doesn't, uh, you know, you have a timer there, you even put a timer and you just go up by itself. Even if it doesn't go up by itself, it doesn't get so hot that it will cause a fire. So that's one. Number two is you can set up a CCTV in your house. Mm. You, and you can also, you know, you find that, uh, what is this tiny uh, office thing? I agree, you know, I say, <laughs> okay. Uh, so you see, the, the other thing is the CCTV. You know, you, nowadays with uh, the handphone, you can, uh, you can just check. Uh, how much getting one in the house, right, right. the living room, is still okay. Yeah. So yeah. it's a remote tower of the checking. Mm. Uh, that's another way. So uh, let me see, off, off back at this thing of the screen. Right? Yeah, so I think uh, th this can lead us to another question, uh, which is how to persuade them to change, you know. Uh, I personally have uh, come across this uh, issue before, you know, like what you mentioned, changing from gas stove to induction. Um, but uh, my mom, was uh, is very reluctant to change. So I think this will Yeah, bring bring us to the other question of how do we persuade them, you know, how can we, you know, sweet talk okay. them? <laughs> I think yeah, they give us some time. Give us some time, we could convince her that uh, it is it is workable. She, she never you know they are some very scared, some people are very scared of uh, electrical things. You know, it, it, yeah. it's like some people are very scared of, of handbones and all things. Some time and maybe bring her to your house if you're using induction. Uh, let her even try out in the house. You have to familiarize her with the induction system. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I, I, I do use uh, induction and she knows how to use it in my yeah. place, but uh, over at the place, she's a little reluctant. But I guess uh, it all boils down to uh, being very, uh, you know, patient and with them and, you know, a lot of love, lah, I guess, uh, will, will help. Uh, help us to relate better. Your relationship with your parents are yeah, very important. Mm. If you have a good relationship from young, it becomes easier. But yeah. if you have a very bad relationship, I imagine it, okay. it, nobody's going to change you now. It's there. It be a lot of them. Yeah. I guess this is where, you know, we, we, we need a lot to help us, you know, oh, because yes. uh, by yes. human nature, we are not very patient people, but we can pray and ask yeah. the Lord to, to teach us. Pray with them. Yeah. Yeah. Pray with them. That would be ideal. Right, right. Yeah, prayer works, you know. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Pastor Chua, for you know, spending I time. I passed my time by five minutes. Uh, okay. Yes, no, no. yes, yeah. <laughs> I was uh, talking like express train sometimes. Right, right. Yeah, but it's all very worth it, you know. So right. thank you so much again, right. Pastor Chua, for, for your time, for your valuable yes, you for in. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's, it's uh, really so good to listen to you. You know, sharing with us your life journey. Uh, thank you so much. And um, well, just uh, moving on to some promo time. Yeah, uh, GBC actually has a seniors ministry. So if you are above fifty-five and are looking for some warm fellowship during the week, you can join the seniors group. Yeah, which uh, meets over Zoom right now because it's still our MCO. Every Wednesday, except public holidays from 10 to 11.30 a.m. All right. So it aims to minister holistically to its participants by, you know, have, doing light exercises. I just found out that they even do it over Zoom. Huh? So, wow, that's so wonderful. And uh, also discussing about, you know, mental and emotional health and visits uh, when it is not our MCO. Lah, and um, praying over... Uh, one another. So, you know, it provides that kind of connection uh, to, to the people, to uh, perhaps, you know, uh, of the same age group. So, if you would like to have more information or if you would like to speak to the pastoral team, uh, the number is uh, being flashed out on, the, on your screen right now. You can call this number 
and uh, uh, 0422871110 from Tuesday to Saturday, 9 to 5 p.m. Yep. Okay, so I guess we have come to the end of the program. Uh, a word of acknowledgement, we would like to thank uh, Pastor Koan for your valuable advice to the team, Gary, Chufui, and Jimmy for your technical support and expertise, and to my co-moderator, Susan, for sharing my load and making this session more interesting. And not forgetting all of you audience, yeah, thank you. It wouldn't have been possible without all of you. Hope you will be able to take home some valuable points yeah, that will help you and your parents. So, God bless all of you. May His face shine upon you. Be safe, keep healthy, and good night. Bye. Bye.